Guy Miner here from UltimateReloader.com, and today we're going to talk about bear, Idaho bear with a big bore marlin. Today we're going to be talking about a remote Idaho black bear hunt that I was just on in May. I got interested in this one because I've hunted bears before. I've hunted bears here in Washington State and I've hunted bears up in Alaska. And I've done pretty well over the years, but I had never done a traditional baited bear hunt. And I thought, you know, this would be a really good opportunity to use maybe something with a modest range like a big bore marlin. Also be a chance to use the fancy new 7PRC that Gavin built last fall. Get that out on a big game hunt, which is what it was intended for. I said, you know, Idaho's not far away. And I got to take a look at it. They are very generous to non-residents as far as fees go for your licenses, your tags, um, and all that. Very generous. So I went ahead and I booked with Cameron Outfitters because I didn't have time to go over there and set up a bait station and get that going. I didn't have all that time, so I had about a week that I could devote to this. And I went ahead and, and went with an outfitter who provides this service. Interestingly, Idaho allows a hunter to take two bears. You can get two bear tags. They're inexpensive. You can also get a wolf tag if you want. And this spring hunt runs through um, from sometime in April through June 30th. That two bear limit makes it very attractive to me because I wanted to use two different rifles. I wanted to use Gavin's 7 PRC and I wanted to use my own Marlin 4570. This is a very good modest range type of hunt. So if you're looking for something up close and personal, this could be it. Now, just getting there, it's a bit of an adventure. Full day drive from my house in central Washington all the way across the Idaho Panhandle and then down south to Darby, Montana, where I spent the night. I like Darby, cool little town. Been there quite a few times over the years. Get up in the morning and go to meet the outfitter and we're gonna be traveling over the Magruder Corridor, a uh, road that leads way back all the way from Darby to Elk City, Idaho. It is very remote, uh, challenging. This was May, May 10th and there was still a lot of snow on the road. On the Montana side, uh, a grader had gone through, and although there was snow on the road, it wasn't bad, okay? No problem there. Put the Jeep in four-wheel drive and just went up. We get up to the top of Nez Perce Pass, and that's where the state line is. Idaho, the only thing that had happened is it had snowed a lot, and then the sun had melted some of it, and some people had driven on it a little bit. So there were deep ruts, 12, 18 inch deep ruts in the snow. And uh, I said, you know what, there's a good challenge for the Jeep. So I followed the outfitter and his uh, Toyota, he calls it a snow runner because it's all set up for going through the snow, great big fat tires, and low gears and all that stuff. And followed him and we made it on into camp. This is a slow road. It's about 60 some miles from Darby on into his camp. And that can take two or three hours easily. We stopped along the way. There was a Jeep, not related to the hunt, upside down in the Selway River. I'm told that the driver managed to get out of it safely. This is an area that you need to be careful in when you're traveling. Any kind of emergency services are a long way away. Communications are very tough. There's no cell service out there. And uh, you just need to, need to kind of watch getting in there. Got to camp. This is called Paradise Camp. This is one of three camps that Cameron Outfitters runs in the same general area there along the Selway River. And I get to camp and it's more than I expected. I mean, so far back in, I had no idea there was gonna be a whole row of tent cabins. Some people like to call them a hardback tent. And it's, it's basically a cabin with a canvas roof. There's a whole row of those. Then there's a big lodge where the food is good place to know. It's just quite an operation. There can be as many as 40 or 50 horses and mules working out of that and it is exclusively for Cameron Outfitters people. The camp has been there about a hundred years. It's been used as logging camp and, and many other things. Uh, it's been there a good long time and well maintained. Cameron Outfitters has only had the place about four years. This is their fourth year of operation. They actually came up from Texas to uh, buy this place out in the middle of the wilderness and run their hunting and fishing out of it and their camping trips out of it. And they're having a great time doing it and it's worth considering. 
Can you hunt this area on your own? Yes, you can. It's public land. You can hunt it on your own. You can go out there and camp and all that. But I wanted to do the whole baited bear thing and get the services of an outfitter. So I did that. It's uh, family owned and operated by Gary and Sherry Cameron. And they have their sons and some nephews and other family members doing much of the other jobs. The tent cabin kind of blew me away. Uh, I walked in and there's two beds, there's a big wood burning stove, whole big pile of firewood, uh, there's a fan in there because in the afternoon it can get a little warm there in the summertime and it was just really really comfortable. It's about 50 yards from the lodge where I would go to eat. Let's talk about Joe, Joe and Kevin. Joe and Kevin are two guys that I met there and Joe is looking at me like, who are you? Who are you? And then he, all of a sudden it comes to him, he says, I know you, you're a guy from Ultimate Reloader. I go, wow, okay, good. Somebody actually knows who I am, excellent. And that was cool, and Kevin and Joe are old friends, they're from Colorado, and they watch Ultimate Reloader. Guys, it was good meeting you. Thank you for sharing your load data. Thanks for hunting with me all week, it was good. Let's talk about Joe's gun. Joe has a beautiful original Marlin guide gun from right around 2000 or so when they were making them. 18 and a half inch ported barrel, straight grip stock, um, six round magazine I believe. He's topped it with a two to seven Nikon scope, which is excellent I think for my opinion. Uh, Montana sling, which is a great sling to use for your hunter. And Joe also, uh, gave me his load, which is right here, and I've got one of, his, one of his pieces of ammunition. He's using a 300 grain Hornady hollow point interlock bullet. 56.6 grains of IMR 3031, make sure you always double check that. Remington 9.5 large rifle primers, he's getting about 1900 feet per second and he's getting sub MOA accuracy out of it, which uh, I've been shooting these big bore marlins a long time, and if you come up with a good load and you learn the technique on how to shoot these bad boys, they will do sub M away, which is kind of impressive when you're talking 300, 350, 405 grain bullets. Joe went out there on the first day he went out, and as he's approaching his stand, his blind, there's a bear. Well, Joe's been hunting a long time. He took care of that situation very quickly, and the bullet went in through the ribs, came out through the opposite shoulder, bear was very dead very quickly. That got a whole bunch of us excited when Joe came back to camp and told us, yeah, I got a bear, this is great. You know, we're thinking, wow, we've been hunting for hours and we've got a week. So that was pretty cool. However, the sad part of the story is the reason I'm telling you about Joe's bear is I didn't get one. I didn't see a bear. They were coming in on my bait at night. They were staying nocturnal, and we moved my bait site, or I moved around to several different bait sites. Never got one in daytime. Uh, Kevin saw one in daytime, didn't manage to get it, so we got one between the three of us, and there were four hunters, so there you go. Kevin's load was another interesting twist. He also used a 300 grain bullet. He went with Barnes bullet, the TSX, which is an excellent big game bullet. Uh, 49 and a half grains of accurate 1680. He went with Starline Brass, Winchester Large Rifle Primer. Um, and he's getting about 2300 feet per second, he tells me, which is a whole lot of velocity out of a 4570. Pretty impressive. I would have liked to have seen the results of that Barnes bullet on a big bear. I usually use the uh, 350 grain round nose soft point Hornady. Uh, 56 and a half grains of IMR 3031, CCI 200 large rifle primers, and I'm getting about 2,000 feet per second. The fun thing with this is uh, we all there at the first day in camp, and we got a chance to check the sight in of our rifles. We put a target up there on a, on a stump about 80 yards away, and we took shots at it. Of course, the PRC was dead on exactly where it was supposed to be. My scope had gotten whacked around a little bit or something on my Marlin and I had to take a few shots and adjust it back in. It was fun watching what the 4570s did to this stump which was sitting on top of another stump. Mine actually knocked it off once. There's a lot of impact from these things. My rifle is good old uh, Marlin 1895, 22 inch barrel, 
I've replaced the factory sights with a set of skinners on the barrel. This is a skinner aperture sight. It works great. Uh, my little loophole is a two and a half power scope, fixed two and a half power and quick release rings. One of my favorite scopes. In fact, I used it last December on a, a mule deer hunt and got a mule deer with it. I, I seem to swap off my sling. Sometimes I have Montana sling on there. Sometimes I have this nice old sling that I have no idea where it came from other than my dad gave it to me about 20 years ago. This has been a very good rifle. The Bergara, this is a custom that Gavin put together. And he built this one, he built two 7PRCs. We've got stories on those out there. And at the same time, he built them. And this is the smaller, lighter one. It still has some substantial weight to it. This is a, uh, this is more of a set in place type rifle. Can you hike in it? Sure, you can hike with it. Uh, I hiked into my blind every day, up to a half a mile, depending on which blind I was using, and hiked right back out with it at night. Not a long hike, but enough to, yeah, I, I knew it was portable. I put a sling on it then. That made it a lot easier to, to hike with. Uh, very nice build, and he has got this uh, muzzle brake on here that has tamed down the recoil considerably. It's sitting in a very attractive Boyd stock. We have the uh, Hawk and Hunter magazine, holds three rounds of 7PRC. It's just a great setup. I got to where I really appreciated the right on scope. This has a lot of magnification. It goes from three up to 24. And what was really nice about it is I would always sit in my blind until after dark before I would start to leave. The scope, with the scope I could clearly see out there well well past sunset, well past um, even when it was legal shoot time, I could see pretty well with it. So that was real nice. It was good to have. It was out in the rain every day. Not every day. It was rained several times on us. And just no problems at all. Very reliable functioning. Sadly, I did not get to pull the trigger. My load for this was 175 grain ELDX, a Hornady bullet, very streamlined, optimized for long range performance. But we have tested the ELDXs at pretty close range in the gel blocks, and I knew if I got a short range shot, it would work too. I used 79 grains of Ramshot LRT. I had not used that powder before working up this load. Um, I went up to 80 at one point and then dropped it back down a grain for my hunting loads. Very happy with that. Federal 215 large rifle Magnum primers getting just over 2,900 feet per second out of this rifle with this 22-inch barrel, which is a little shorter than most Magnum-type cartridges usually deal well with. The accuracy has been outstanding, uh, easily at half MOA. Really wish I'd gotten to use this on a bear. There was another fellow in camp. I did not get a picture of him, uh, Zach. And he has a Browning 270 Winchester. Has a three to nine loop hold on it. It is a very traditional, you know, kind of normal hunting rifle. Fairly light, plenty accurate. He had no problems when he got it dialed in and had no problems making good tight groups with it. And he was using Winchester 130 grain uh, Super X soft point factory ammunition. Um, excellent rifle. And again, he did not get a shot at a bear either. Nocturnal bears. Try to avoid them, go for the daylight bears. A typical day for our hunt, get up early, 4.30ish, pull on some clothes, head over to the lodge, get a quick breakfast, about five or 5.15, head out in a four wheel drive vehicle or possibly on a horse or mule, depending on how you're moving around out there. Uh, we'd usually sit on the blinds for three to four hours in the morning, stay out there and then it was pretty easy to get back out to the road, get picked up and head on back into the lodge for lunch and a nap. And that happened day after day. And then we'd go out again in the evening, about five o'clock in the evening and stay out until, until dark. We got one bear between the four hunters. Um, lots of bears were out there. We had a couple other guys that came in from what they call the, uh, they were out in the outback type camps where you pack out on the horses and stay out there for three to six days. A couple of those guys did get bears. By the way, the bears in this area are not known for being huge. One bear taken was estimated about 250 pounds, but an average adult bear in that area is probably around 120 to 170 pounds, somewhere in there. These are not giant bears, um, but they're good eating bears. Uh, everything Gary and the other folks have told me about is that they come out of hibernation and they chow down on that fresh spring green grass and they are very clean, lean tasting bears, good meat. So that's a plus. Conclusions. There are bears, lions, 
wolves all out there. You can get tags for all of them inexpensively. They're abundant in that area, and the state has decided they want to reduce the predator population in that area to help the elk herds and the deer herds come back to their more historic levels. Tags and licenses, even for non-residents, are quite reasonable. I think that for my license, two bear tags and a wolf tag, I was out about $329, which is a bargain as far as I'm concerned. Outfitter, like Cameron Outfitters or some of the other outfitters in the area, not required, but it can be a very good idea. They're very popular. They see a lot of business. Um, Gary Cameron told me that that camp often takes as many as 50 bears in a year right there from Paradise Camp. So that's pretty impressive. Um, I would say that as far as a rifle goes, whatever you've got for a good deer rifle is probably going to work just fine out there for bear. It's perfect for using something that maybe you don't carry a lot because you like to be prepared for those three or four hundred yard shots. That's one of the reasons I wanted to take my Marlin. And, and by the way, Gary the Outfitter was very pleased to see three big bore Marlins show up on, on the first day of camp. That was pretty cool. Um, if you want something longer range, you can. There's not a lot of long range opportunities. There are some. And uh, there was one place where we could have gotten out to at least a 600 yard shot. That would have been real interesting. That would have been perfect for this big rifle. In conclusion, Idaho is a great place to go for a spring bear hunt. They also have fall bear hunting. There are bears, there are lions, there are wolves. These predator tags are inexpensive to get from Idaho, provides a great opportunity for either resident or non-resident hunters. You can do a do-it-yourself hunt. You can go with an outfitter like Cameron Outfitters like I did. What I want to know is are you doing some bear hunting? If so, what rifle are you using? What's your load? And how's your success been? With that, it's time to wrap it up. I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, we're on Facebook, YouTube, Rumble, where we've got unrestricted content, and Instagram. Make sure to follow us on all those channels. Ultimate Reloader also has a commercial solutions division serving law enforcement, the military, and the gun industry. We have some unique capabilities, including a comprehensive suite of recoil testing and evaluation capabilities, trigger profiling, and more. If you're interested in custom rifles like what we build here on the channel or gunsmithing services, you're going to want to go to rifles.ultimatereloader.com and get on the wait list. If you want to learn lucrative gunsmithing like what I show here on the channel, including building custom rifles and Cerakote plus a whole bunch more, you're going to want to check out the Colorado School of Trades, schooloftrades.edu. Thanks again for watching.